now very successfully established at the IMF, uh, Dr. Tao Zheng. And um, uh, in, in having this conversation today, we're also reminding ourselves that we're about halfway through in this series that we've been doing with Caffin and with uh, Nervikar and Galena's help. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed all of these conversations. They're very informative, and I'm very grateful that all of you uh, are participating with us and engaged with us. We've had about 50 to 60 people or even more uh, on a weekly basis. So that's quite a commitment. And thank you for your dedication. Now, I, I know we have a special speaker today, but we also have a favorite chancellor here today. Uh, Cindy uh, uh, Chancellor Larive, uh, the chancellor at UC Santa Cruz is with us this morning. And I wanna pass it on to her. She's uh, here to give us some welcome remarks and introduce our guests. Chancellor, welcome. Well, well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say a, a few words about our Center for Analytical uh, Finance, CAFIN, and uh, welcome everybody who's uh, coming to this great seminar this morning. So uh, the Center for Analytical S Finance was formed as a research center in our Division of Social Sciences here at UC Santa Cruz about a decade ago. And it's supported by the Dean, by UC Santa Cruz alumni, and recently by UC Investments as well. So we thank, thank you for that, Jagdeep. The center was initially motivated by the global financial crisis of 2008. And with a goal of uh, avoiding the recurrence of such problems. And, we all know that finance is inherently complex and risky, and CAFIN focuses on understanding those risks and the possibilities for innovation and for improvements in financial inclusion. And the center has a global network of researchers, practitioners, and policymakers um, seeking to, um, and a steering committee of faculty from uh, UC Santa Cruz economics and statistics departments there's also an advisory board that's headed by a UC alumnus and foundation trustee and, and CAFIN donor, uh, Stephen Bruce, uh, with financial practitioners as members of the advisory board. And so the center has supported research projects on improving efficiency and fairness of financial markets and educational projects to increase the financial literacy of our university students, among other activities. This current webinar series is part of our mission of disseminating cutting edge, relevant research and policy analysis for the benefit of the public. And the focus of the, the um, series is on financial risks, technological innovation and impacts on financial inclusion as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've had speakers from academia, private sector and global organizations such as the IMF, including today's uh, a distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Tao Zhang, and the World Bank. And so the partnership with UC Investments was launched in 2020, thanks to the initiative of Jagdeep Batchelor, the Chief Investment Officer of the University of California, and someone renowned and respected by all of us at the university. Uh, the long-term goal of this partnership is to increase collaboration and cooperation among UC faculty in finance and related areas and to enhance the public knowledge and bring the benefits of the university uh, to the greater California community. So um, thanks for this chance to say a few words. Welcome everyone to this wonderful seminar and uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zhang, for uh, being with us today and for your presentation. Great. Thank you, Cindy, and very much appreciate it. Thank you, Jagdeep, and thank you, Cindy, for this introduction. I'm Galina Hale, co-director of the CAFIN, and it's my great pleasure to introduce today Mr. Tao Zhang, who is an alumni of UC Santa Cruz. He was a PhD student of Nirvikar, uh, co-director of CAFIN with me. Uh, Dr. Zhang currently is a Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, and previously he served as a Deputy Governor at People's Bank uh, of China, as well as the uh, IMF Executive Director for China. And today he'll, talk, he'll speak to us about um, uh, digital currencies uh, and their implications for monetary and financial stability. 
Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Karina. And, uh, and also thanks uh, the uh, 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 Jack Deep uh, for the introductions and also for uh, Cindy's uh, chancellors uh, for the opening remarks. And um, it is my uh, great pleasure uh, to participate uh, in this uh, webinar uh, hosted by my uh, alma mater. Uh, and I know uh, uh, some of my professors are, are here and I consider this is my uh, sort of the, uh, the, uh, the test <laughs> in some of the subject. Yeah. And, um, and, and, th and I particularly thank uh, Professor Singh, uh, Nervika, uh, uh, inviting me uh, to this webinars. And, and I, uh, if any, uh, I said anything is wrong, please uh, correct me. Um, when I try to uh, select what topic uh, may uh, best link uh, all the elements uh, in financial risks, uh, innovations, and inclusion, in the post-COVID. I uh, uh, thought about uh, the, uh, the cross-border payments, uh, digital monies, and, and their impact uh, in the post-COVID world. So uh, this is the, the themes uh, of my talk today. So let me start with um, why we uh, care uh, uh, cross-border payments. Um, uh, many uh, may consider uh, cross-border payment uh, plumbing uh, and normally uh, keep it uh, hidden in somewhere. Um, but it is actually at the center stage in uh, policy making today. Um, we have the, the following reasons. Um, first, uh, cross-border payments are at the heart of the international monetary system as well as the, the lives of the most vulnerable, of, of course, today's we pay uh, a close attention to. And yet, the uh, second, the, uh, the reason is the uh, cross-border payments have limitations, uh, especially for lower income and emerging economies. And uh, cross-border payments remain slow, uh, OPEC, uh, expensive, and sometimes not accessible uh, by, uh, by many. And just give you uh, a sort of idea um, what is the typical numbers we cite these days. Uh, in terms of remittances, uh, the cost is still 77% uh, on average, uh, more than twice uh, the target set by uh, the UN, uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the correspondent banks, uh, this, these are the, uh, the banks uh, provide access to uh, cross-border payment, uh, are 22% fewer uh, since uh, 2011, uh, which is about 10 years ago. And uh, they may not even be uh, accessible uh, to uh, part of the 1.7 billion people worldwide who actually uh, are, are not uh, banked at this moment. So there is the issues of the uh, financial inclusion. Um, so as you can expect, uh, in the COVID era, those hit harder are countries with a higher shares of unbanked population, uh, with the greater reliance on remittances, uh, those with uh, lower access to correspondent banks and less liquid foreign exchange market, of course. So uh, in sum, uh, there are several key frictions uh, explain the limitations of the current uh, cross-border payment systems. And these limitations have been uh, widely recognized for some time, so this is not new. But uh, nonetheless, the, these limitations uh, have not been uh, enough, I mean, uh, adequately uh, addressed. And there's uh, not enough uh, has been done to date. And um, 
uh, countries uh, tend to have, uh, you know, underinvested in solving these issues, uh, including, uh, for example, uh, interoperability and in creating public goods available across border. So these are the problems. Um, so can digital money come to rescue? Um, so that's the natural questions. Uh, it looks uh, helpful, but the, uh, while the potential solutions uh, are there, and the, these are, could bring uh, uh, significant efficiency gains, it could also affect monetary and uh, financial um, stabilities. So in short, uh, it is very timely to discuss this issue today um, because we are living through a phase of uh, unprecedented uh, global drive to uh, improve the efficiencies of cross-border payment. Uh, for example, uh, Facebook's uh, Libra uh, pledges to uh, improve cross-border payments. Um, many countries are working with CBDCs, uh, which is a central bank uh, digital currencies. Uh, and the international community has worked tremendously on this topic as well. Um, the G20 Financial Stability Board, CPMI, uh, the BIS, and of course, uh, IMF, uh, we, we, also, we all work together, uh, you know, uh, have a lot of the uh, research analysis. So uh, much of my, uh, my talk today uh, actually drawn from these discussions uh, and the development. Uh, particularly the, uh, uh, from the IMF recent publications, uh, the publication entitled uh, the Digital, Digital Money uh, Cross-Border uh, Macro Financial Implications. So in the next uh, few minutes, I will start with uh, what is the CBDC? And, uh, and then of course have a brief overview uh, of the global trend uh, in the explorations of the CBDCs. I will then talk about the, uh, the potential uh, macro financial implications of the uh, CDBC's adoptions in the cross-border payments, uh, primarily focusing on four selected key areas. Um, and after that, I will outline the policy challenges that the, uh, the country authorities and international communities uh, could face uh, as they aim to uh, try to realize the benefit of the CDBCs uh, while uh, mitigate the, uh, the risk. So uh, let me start with uh, what is uh, CBDCs or what are CBDCs? Um, uh, CBDCs are a, uh, a digital form of fiat um, money issued by a central bank. Um, in short, uh, there they are, they, they are two uh, variations of CBDC's uh, uh, prototypes. Uh, one is called the wholesale, the other one called the, of course, the uh, retail, but not exactly retail, but it is for general purposes. And my talk today is, uh, will pretty much focus on the, uh, the retail uh, CBDC's which uh, is defined as a uh, widely accessible digital form of central bank fiat money uh, that is uh, legal tender. So that's sort of the, uh, the languages here. And this definition is very similar to those uh, adopted by uh, BIS and uh, CPMI. Um, so uh, CPMI is a committee of payment and uh, money, uh, mark um, market infrastructures. Um, so, um, and I have to say that the, uh, so far, uh, no central bank has issued a retail CBDC, uh, but several central banks uh, have started to run a CBDC uh, pilot. Uh, uh, many of them are small economies, like uh, Bahamas, uh, Eastern uh, Caribbeans, but they also have, uh, you know, uh, big countries such as China and uh, advanced countries like uh, uh, Sweden. Um, uh, majority of the, uh, the major central banks such as uh, the Federal Reserves and uh, ECB, Bank of Japan, uh, Bank of England, they, they have not yet to 
you know, issue the CDBCs, but they are uh, actively undertaking experiments uh, as a uh, contingencies. Um, now, let's uh, take a look at it, how CBDCs are adopted or envisaged to be adopted uh, for cross-border payment. Uh, Galina, can you show the um, figure one here? Thank you. Okay, so as you see, cross-border use of currencies uh, generally uh, fall into two categories, um, namely uh, the, uh, the use of currencies for international transactions and domestic use of currency issued by a uh, foreign uh, uh, the, um, uh, entities. Of course, in the first categories, uh, international currencies served as a, uh, a medium uh, exchange, uh, store uh, values and unit accounts, and are used for international trade, finance, and uh, foreign exchange uh, transactions and reserves. Uh, in the second category, categories, a, uh, a foreign currency displaced a domestic currencies for domestic transactions which is a situation commonly referred to as uh, currency substitutions. So traditionally, um, the economic weight of a countries and uh, the broader geopolitical factors have been major drivers of the international use of uh, currencies. And in addition, network effect or externalities uh, reinforced by uh, synergies across monetary uh, functions also have a strong effect on the uh, international use of a currencies. Once a currency is established internationally, uh, the fact that it is used by many entities increase the likelihood that others will adopt. So these are quite uh, well known. Then why CBDCs are considered uh, for the cross-border adoptions and use? The most notable reasons is their abilities to uh, lower uh, transaction cost and increase uh, accessibility, uh, which is the issues related to uh, financial uh, inclusions. And of course, um, access to foreign currencies can be challenging uh, to establish, as we know, uh, especially in uh, rural uh, or in remote areas uh, in countries, uh, you know, less developed. And CBDCs have the potential to overcome uh, some of these impediments as they uh, can design either a, as direct claim on the issuing central bank or uh, some form of digital cash, uh, which can be transferred peer-to-peer uh, -peer directly uh, without going through a bank. So although many of the uh, current CDBC uh, uh, project and pilots are domestic focused, various uh, bilateral experiments have demonstrated the feasibilities of using uh, CBDCs for uh, cross-border payments. So here uh, we consider uh, three uh, basic scenarios. Um, uh, Galina, can you show uh, figure two here? Thank you. Scenario one, let me explain a little very briefly, um, considers a niche use for cross-border payments. Here a CBDC is used as a preferred means for small value transactions, uh, such as uh, remittances uh, across borders. Uh, scenario two considers uh, greater currency uh, substitutions in some countries. Uh, for example, uh, if a foreign CBDC is packed to a existing uh, fiat currencies, it will induce uh, it will induce a greater use of foreign currencies. And 
scenario three considers a global adoptions with uh, multi uh, polarity. And this is the scenarios of uh, competitions between a few major CBDCs that represent independent uh, unit of cost. So of course, these are hypothetical, but these are the uh, sort of the uh, um, uh, summaries of the, uh, what people uh, in their mind at this moment uh, to think about the, uh, the possible, uh, the, the perspective uh, for the CBDCs to be adopted uh, in a cross-border uh, payment. So let me move on to um, the impact. I will uh, focus on the comment on the uh, four, the following four areas. Um, first is monetary policies, second, financial stability, uh, third, uh, capital flow management, and fourth, uh, international uh, monetary system. In terms of the monetary policy impact, most of the concerns uh, focus on the effect of the currency substitutions or in a long uh, digital world, what we call uh, dollarizations. So this is not new. Domestic use of, of foreign CBDCs uh, can imp impair monetary policy transmissions by increasing uh, currency uh, substitutions. Um, and what is new here, um, the substitutions uh, into CBDCs um, can, you know, the uh, uh, make make those uh, currencies which have suffered from high inflations and large exchange rate volatilities, uh, make them uh, more convenient and easier um, to enable these uh, substitutions at a faster pace and at a larger scale. And if a CDBC is uh, to be used for, uh, for example, specific uh, international transactions, for example, such as the uh, uh, remittances, uh, the direct uh, impact on monetary policies may be limited, uh, but um, there could be an indirect effect if digital currencies reduce transaction costs or regulatory barriers, uh, which result in the increased uh, remittance flow. Uh, in this case, of course, the uh, currency substitutions uh, would be uh, very uh, significant. And another scenario is if uh, countries with weak uh, fundamentals use a foreign currencies, including uh, by granting a legal uh, tender status to the CBDCs, and of course the currency substitution could be sizable and the monetary policy effect could be very significantly eroded. And of course, if you consider uh, exchange rate regimes, CBDCs could also have an impact uh, in terms of the choices, um, particularly uh, when several global adopted CBDCs would come to coexist, which is scenario three, which I, uh, in, in, in the graph too. The monetary policy implications, of course, uh, will depend on whether this uh, multi uh, polarities uh, takes the form of currency uh, 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 blocks or uh, currency competitions within uh, each country. Finally, cross-border use of CBDC could also complicate the conduct of monetary policies in the issuing uh, countries if external demand for the CBDCs result in the large capital inflows. So uh, these are the things. Coming to financial uh, stability, um, the financial stability implications largely depend on uh, the design, skill, adoptions, and financial system structures uh, of the countries concerned. And for example, uh, greater uh, currency substitutions could add additional pressures on funding and solvent, uh, solvency risk relative to those typically observed in partially uh, dollarized economy. And of course, the, the use of foreign CBDCs uh, could also lead to a higher run risk in stressful time. 
And some views actually uh, argue that uh, CBDC could lead to uh, disintermediations uh, even in normal times. And of course, higher run risks uh, in stress times in the issuing uh, countries. In uh, scenario three, uh, which is there are several major C CBDC coexisted, uh, currency competitions within a juris jurisdictions uh, could make local financial conditions more uh, volatile. So these are um, quite obvious. The third areas I want to talk uh, briefly is on capital flow management. Um, you know, uh, capital flow management measures uh, or restrictions uh, have been adopted by many countries. Um, they uh, could be uh, circumvented by uh, CBDCs. And if that's the case, then country could face a, you know, the starker problems of the policy trilemma which complicated the, uh, the conduct of both monetary and exchange rate policies. Um, and um, so these are the, uh, on the uh, capital account. Finally, on international monetary uh, system. Uh, in general, um, it is very hard to forecast uh, how the international monetary system might evolve with the advent of the uh, CBDCs, but no uh, changes to international monetary systems um, as we see it are likely to be very slow. Um, and the, because the changes are pretty much driven by, you know, the uh, structural changes involving establishing uh, policy credibilities, the rule of laws and the deep and the liquid market uh, in the same uh, denomination. So these are well known in the, in the textbook and also in the in the practices. But in the longer run, uh, the existence of widely available CBDCs and strong network externalities uh, could accelerate the shift in reserve currency status. Uh, for example, digitalization could facilitate uh, cross-border use of currencies, reshaping the demand for and supply of uh, safe uh, assets. And so uh, if you consider uh, all of these uh, different scenarios, uh, it will get involved very complicated pictures in terms of uh, how, what's the impact. Uh, let me just pick one. Um, in the multi-polar um, uh, world, reserve compositions could be diversified uh, between uh, or within countries, uh, depending on uh, whether currency block form or currency compete with each country. This is, I mentioned early on. So uh, the dynamics quite different. Finally, I want to uh, briefly uh, have, uh, you know, have a uh, uh, comment on the issuance of the CBDCs uh, cross borders could uh, raise uh, border issues for uh, the international payment uh, ecosystems. So the reason is obvious uh, because uh, CBDCs could give countries the abilities to transact uh, separately. So it's a new commerce and people can uh, transact uh, directly. And of course, the, the impact, um, it, it will depend on how the system will evolve. But here we will say we, we have to keep a close attention, uh, a close look at it. So um, let me move on uh, in the interest of time. Uh, on the uh, challenges, a fundamental and over arching uh, challenge or question is how to ensure the solutions are uh, inclusive. Um, I mention this uh, because um, there is a wide range of the needs uh, for countries uh, because the countries differs uh, relative to the focus of their reform effort. Um, some countries uh, using CBDCs focusing on reducing barriers for uh, to re re remittances, 
Others are seeking ways to reestablish correspondent banking relations, while also others uh, seeking uh, linking advanced payment system between central banks. So these all kinds of demands uh, differ. So it's very much challenging uh, to find the solutions to match a, uh, these wide range of the demand. Another important challenge is, uh, concerns the balance uh, and the nature of the interactions between the public and the private sectors uh, in providing uh, novel solutions uh, to cross-border payment. And so here you, 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 you heard a lot of talks and discussions uh, who you know, should play what kind of role. And certainly uh, there are uh, discussions of the comparative advantages of the private sectors and uh, public sectors. And normally we consider uh, private sectors uh, is to interface with clients and uh, be more innovative uh, while the public sectors is to regulate and supervise and make sure uh, a uh, level playing field will be there. And of course, overcome the market failures and ultimately uh, bring trust to the uh, payment system. But at the end of the day, you see uh, this is uh, you know, clear, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the clear challenge because the questions are complex and equally, of course, opportunities are enormous. And lastly, um, I want to talk about the, uh, the challenges, which is the uh, interoperabilities. Um, as pointed out by the BIS, the CVDC systems will now uh, will enter a, a crowded uh, field of the uh, domestic payment systems, and interoperabilities can enable uh, complementarities and coexistence. But the uh, obviously interoperabilities uh, calls for common designs, legal and infrastructure requirements, which can only be established through. Uh, cooperations among the countries, which by itself, of course, is a challenge. And um, because this is uh, uh, simply go beyond just the, uh, the technical designs uh, on the common standard or interfaces, uh, the different legal and regulatory frameworks present the significant uh, barriers to cross-border payment. Uh, in terms of the in, interoperabilities. Therefore, uh, harmonizing these frameworks would be a challenge. So that's the, the challenge. Uh, let me sort of conclude um, summarizing. Uh, first, of course, the, uh, the country should take advantage of the new technologies uh, to reap the benefits, but at the same time uh, address the risk. And CVDCs can increase the, you know, the uh, uh, reduce the cost and of course the uh, uh, raise the efficiencies, uh, enhance the accessibilities uh, for the financial inclusions, but at the same time bring the uh, uh, risk to monetary and financial uh, stability uh, risk. And of course, the uh, authorities around the world and international communities are actively trying to move forward together um, with the rapid pace of the technology uh, advances. Um, and I think the, uh, um, I don't want to get, it, get into the details uh, in, in the interest of time, but just mention that the, uh, the Financial Stability Board recently uh, presented a report with a concrete a roadmap to enhance cross-border payments, of course, uh, to which the IMF uh, significantly uh, contributed. Um, and at the same time, uh, speaking uh, of uh, our institutions, the IMF, uh, of course, we have a near um, universal memberships. We conduct the uh, macro uh, financial uh, surveillance and outlooks. So, uh, we consider ourselves uh, can have the abilities to offer a uh, uh, ideal platform to discuss the issues of CBDCs, including these uh, issues of interoperabilities and spillovers. 
Um, and of course, the, the fund can work as a bridge uh, between this high level policy development process and implementation of the reforms within uh, countries. So as you see that the, there are problems or issues of surveillance, uh, focusing on what's going on, and on the other hand, we have to help the memberships uh, in terms of capacity buildings, uh, make sure everybody come to the same page. And of course, the agenda for further actions remains uh, vast, uh, but uh, I can only uh, uh, talk uh, about these issues at this, in this moment. So let me stop here and uh, thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Jiang, for a very interesting presentation. So I'm asking the audience to put their, their questions in the Q&A function. In the meantime, um, I'm going to ask Jagdeep to ask a, a question that uh, he had. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the background, uh, Tao. Uh, we just saw that China announced a digital uh, currency and uh, is promoting the use of that, motivating the use of that uh, within the country. Um, this is a first for a central bank. Uh, what does this mean to the rest of the world? And starting with what does it mean to China in terms of its ambitions uh, on how it manages digital currencies? Yeah. Um... Uh, thank you for your questions, uh, Jagdeep. And uh, I know the uh, the uh, lot of uh, attention is paid to uh, uh, what happened in China in terms of the uh, uh, the um, uh, the digital uh, uh, currencies. Um, what you know, the starting in uh, as as early as two thousand fourteen, they they started or launched the, the programs called uh, DC slash EP, basically digital currency slash uh, electronic payment uh, project. So whether or not uh, this fit in into our uh, CBDC's uh, definitions is a matter of, you know, the uh, sort of debate. Um, but the, the purpose um, is try to take advantage of the technology and focusing on um, domestic uh, issues uh, to start with. Um, particularly, um, as, as you know, China is a huge country and um, there are uh, the uh, significant uh, problems in terms of the uh, financial inclusions in the remote and rural areas. And plus the, uh, the, the paper, um, money or the circulation of the paper RMB is carries a huge cost in terms of you know the uh, circulations and protecting uh, from you know the uh, uh, the uh, uh, related to the effort of the uh, counter feeling count ceilings um, so so the authorities wanted to um, uh, to try uh, whether or not they will be able to uh, take advantage of the, you know, the new technologies to reduce these costs at the same time to increase the, uh, the efficiencies in terms of the uh, payment systems, particularly domestic payment systems. And also, um, as you know, the, uh, the digital applications in China, is, you know, happen uh, rapidly uh, started with Alipay and Tension the WeChat phase. So we have a different forms platforms uh, in terms of the uh, the uh, third party what we call third party uh, payment uh, beyond the traditional uh, banking uh, systems. And so the introducing of the uh, 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 the central bank uh, e money. Uh, would help to, you know, reduce the problems of the uh, fragmentations. So, um, so I think these are the purposes. In their words, is I think the at this at this at least uh, currently they are 
uh, targeting at the uh, try to replace the uh, uh, the M zero uh, in in the in the paper circulations um, with the uh, the digital um, currencies. And and I think the um, at this moment uh, there's not I I don't think they have uh, already run into the problems in terms of the cross-border payments yet. Um, but I know they are working together with, uh, with others, uh, uh, you know, um, bilaterally and, and uh, through the BIS, uh, working with the, uh, the, the major central banks uh, um, if the issue arise. Uh, but currently the major focus is on um, domestic uh, issues and and currently they are not uh, issuing the currency the e currency yet uh, they are still at the advanced uh, pilot stage uh, right now uh, the piloting uh, they are piloting in four um, major cities uh, the most recent as you uh, as you mentioned it uh, the piloting in uh, Shenzhen which is uh, the major city neighboring Hong Kong uh, with uh, I think is with um, uh, uh, one uh, one point five million U.S. dollar equivalent. Uh, uh, that kind of money uh, to retail uh, stores and, and 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 individuals. Probably later on they will uh, try it in in some other occasions, including you know anticipating the Winter Olympic uh, is coming uh, uh, soon. They probably want to have a test on that as well. Thank you. I have uh, a number of questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to just try to aggregate them for you. Um, and so maybe you can comment on all of this. So a number of questions are addressing uh, specific challenges that people think about when they think about CBDCs, uh, in particular, their relationship with private digital currencies and whether um, you envision the coexistence or the substitution between the two. And, um, you know, if you envision coexistence, uh, how do you think about the criminal activities uh, using private digital currencies for their cross-border flows? Another issue that people raise is um, in, in terms of the exchange rates, if we have multiple CBDCs, how do we expect foreign exchange markets to function in particular if we have a central bank digital currency would you expect it to have the same spot rate as the fiat currency uh, in the foreign exchange markets and then uh, a question that arises all the time obviously is of the um, cyber attack risks and how do you think about that and finally um, a question uh, from Michael Hutchison is about um, the relationship between CBDCs and uh, capital controls. How would the functioning of CBDCs be different in China that has capital controls versus Sweden that has a very open capital account? Uh, and one, one more question is, um, if there is a widespread adoption of digital currencies, including CBDCs that offsets people's bank deposits, what do you think this would do to the monetary policy transmission mechanism? Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Garina. I hope uh, I can uh, memorize all these uh, important questions. Um, um, let me start with the uh, the first one the um, uh, the the interactions between the public and uh, private sectors um, i I elaborate a little bit uh, in my uh, uh, remarks earlier and here um, uh, the direct uh, questions or challenges is the uh, the competition between the two. Um, of course, at this moment, uh, we have some, um, you know, so-called stable coins um, and, and, and some uh, the, uh, um, you know, the cryptocurrencies. Um, 
what they call currencies, but you know, by definitions, uh, it is not a a sort of the uh, um, uh, at the same categories as fiat uh, currencies. Uh, put this way, uh, that's why I my my remarks focused on CBDCs, which all of them are. If they issued, they were they will be issued by central bank, which is carry the legal leverage. Um, and and other type of the digital monies, including cryptocurrencies or stable coins, which is supposed to be backed up by uh, asset or or other uh, fiat uh, money. So, so these are major differences between the two. Um, and in reality, we don't have a CBDC yet. Uh, we have some stable coins, um, but circulated in uh, in you know the the, the local uh, in certain specific sectors, but not widely uh, uh, you know adopted. And we do have the uh, proposals uh, by Libra, uh, which is supposed to be uh, a global uh, uh, stable coins or uh, GICs. Um, once uh, if it is adopted, then it carries a global uh, implications. And the obviously uh, there, there are many issues that can be uh, can be discussed, and many of the impact uh, by CDB, CBDCs can equally apply to global uh, the uh, uh, sta uh, stable coins. Um, and 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 because it is not the uh, the fiat money type. Um, it, it has additional concerns beyond uh, CBDCs. Um, the, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the one is, uh, which is related to the, your second questions, the, uh, uh, what about the exchange rate, uh, the, how stable they are, uh, the, uh, certainly in that regard, uh, uh, stable coin is less stable than uh, C CBDCs. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, the, uh, if you concern domestic uh, monetary policies, if uh, a um, you know the uh, uh, GSCs uh, will be adopted in a foreign countries, uh, which supposed to have weaker uh, economic fundamentals, uh, then then there's the concerns of the loss of uh, the monetary uh, authorities uh, or sovereign. Um, and so, um, so in short, uh, they, they are typical concerns in terms of the uh, monetary and uh, financial stability concern. There are also, um, other concerns, uh, beyond the traditional, uh, the, just the monetary and uh, financial stability concerns, uh, when you come to the private sector issued, uh, uh, the uh, stable currencies or cryptocurrencies. So um, uh, among them, uh, uh, of course, the uh, the uh, the but in particular the uh, the concerns of the uh, uh, cyber securities, uh, you know, the fraud, uh, uh, counterfeiting, um, and money laundering, and and all of these. Um, compare with CDBCs and uh, you know the uh, private uh, issued currencies. At least CBDCs. You know the uh, from the designs. I mean, depend on how would you design the uh, the CBDCs. Uh, we we can consider the CBDCs uh, have some sort of degree of control. Uh, but of course, in that regard, I mean, if central bank has a clear control on not only in terms of the issuings, but also in terms of the access, you know, tracing the transactions. Then there's the issues of the uh, privacies, uh, uh, any uh, an anonymities, uh, this type of things uh, coming in. And, uh, and if you consider all of these issues uh, either in the, uh, in the context of the uh, GSCs, and certainly uh, there is greater concerns on, uh, in those uh, areas uh, as well, so uh, so it's very quite complicated. Um, 
the the second question is on um, the if you have a multi uh, polar uh, CVDCs, um, then what about exchange rate? And as I elaborate early on, certainly the, for any of the monetary authorities, uh, try to anchor their exchange rates become much more difficult. Uh, and, and also depend on how these currencies will interact with each other. It could inform leading to currency blocks or it is leading to uh, you know, currency competitions. We'll end it up with different uh, result. Um, cyber attack, sure. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, the uh, CBDCs employ the uh, technologies. And ideally, we hope the, uh, they can uh, secure uh, whatever the, uh, the technologies which is protect the uh, circulations of the, uh, of the currencies, including uh, protected privacies. But as you know, technologies, <laughs> you know, the, uh, uh, you have something, uh, then always there is a answers. Um, so that's why um, the uh, authorities around the world are very cautious um, want to make sure uh, the security can be realized at least to some comfortable levels. Um, so that's so can, the, the the sentiment is a, uh, having observed the uh, the benefits bring up by the uh, technologies, uh, people are very uh, concerned. Um, the uh, how to make sure the the uh, um, the, um, uh, the make sure the comfortableness of the, uh, the securities can be also realized um, when you get into this these areas. Um, so so that's why people said the uh, uh, they want to make sure they want to continue to observe, they want to continue to engage into the research, but very cautious, prudent to move forward um, with real actions. Um, so I, I thank the questions to, uh, you know, my professors as also uh, Michael Hutchison's. Hi, Michael, my there, a long time no see. Um, and uh, the final questions is um, uh, CBDC, uh, versus the, um, what exactly the point? I forgot the uh, the final one. On the monetary policy transmission. Oh, transmission, people use yes. digital currencies and not bank deposits. Right, right. So it depends on how the, um, the CBDCs are gonna be designed. Uh, let's say uh, CBDC design in a way uh, have a direct, uh, the central bank open up the direct account together with uh, individuals. And certainly there are the concerns of the substitutional effect. Uh, they will involve the, the bank runs or uh, deposit movement to, from, the central, from the commercial bank to central bank. Um, but, I, but I think the, uh, uh, if you go for different kind of designs, that will mitigate the, uh, the concerns of this uh, deposit uh, movement. For example, uh, uh, I think right now what uh, China did is the, they work together with a commercial bank and they, uh, yes, they open, the central bank issued the uh, digital currencies and they posted in, uh, in the commercial banks. So it looks like the uh, commercial bank work as a custodian um, then in that way and the, and of course, the uh, the commercial bank uh, had the full uh, reserve requirement at the central bank, uh, so that uh, with the one-to-one -one ratios, so that to make sure this uh, uh, deposit, uh, uh, you know, movement uh, to minimize that. So far, I think, of course, the pilot, uh, we, we it is not a has not become a a, a serious uh, problems. Uh, I believe uh, other central bank would. Uh, pay uh, close attention to that uh, issues as well. Um, so um, once again, it's pretty much depend on uh, 
you know, the, uh, uh, the designs and, uh, and the intentions of the central banks. And certainly if you, uh, this is, uh, different countries have, would have a different solutions. If, if you are, have a very complicated uh, uh, financial uh, structures or if you are, if you, you are big economies versus those, you know, simple uh, structured economies, uh, very simple financial sectors that could be different. Thank you very much. I think you touched upon uh, all these questions. I have one more question in the feed and we have about two minutes le left. This is a question about whether the blockchain type ledger uh, is associated with central bank digital currencies, specifically with the China DCEP. Um, well, well that's, a, that's a good question. Um, the, to my knowledge, the uh, uh, the DLT certainly is one of the cons one of the options, um, but like others, uh, the I think central banks are quite open to uh, the the choices of uh, technologies. Uh, in in the case of China, uh, as they said, they want to work together with uh, the private sectors or commercial sectors and uh, different uh, commercial uh, or private uh, applications or platform, they may choose uh, different uh, kind of uh, technologies. Some of them are uh, probably the uh, DLT based and some of them are not. So it's sort of like, you know, competitions in terms of technologies uh, as long as they uh, serve the purposes. Um, but of course, later on, there's the problems or issues of the interoperabilities. Um, once the uh, different platform engage into different uh, technologies, um, then, then I think this is, of course, the, uh, the issues down the road. Um, at this moment, uh, I think what they keep the view is uh, open, uh, open-minded without uh, predetermined uh, which technology would be prevailed or pre preferable to, to others. Thank you so much. We are exactly on time. I would like to thank again uh, Tao Zhang for spending time with us this morning. I'm sure his life is really busy. And if we could clap, we could all clap. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, hope to see you soon in some venue in person. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Galina. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.